The cryptocurrency world is evolving fast. There are now over 12,000 coins in the crypto ecosystem. And with so many coins and even more data points, a rigorous classification system is becoming increasingly essential for investors to structure sound investment decisions. So what are they? And which digital asset categories offer the biggest opportunities and risks short-term and long-term? Hello and welcome to Beyond Bitcoin and Metaverse, crypto categories investors should know. I'm Bob Lang. Joining us today is leading expert who spends his day in the crypto universe, Matthew Siegel, head of digital assets research at Vanek. Thanks for joining us today. So let's get right to it. First, Matthew, what is digital asset categorization and why is it so important to sort out the crypto world in this way? Traditional investors have been trying to measure performance versus benchmarks for a long time. And one of the tools that helps them achieve that is by breaking down the equity markets into sectors like technology, financials, consumer staples, telecom, etc. And that not only gives individual investors a chance to express a particular view on the sector, uh, but it also gives diversified portfolio managers better information sources so that they can understand the drivers of their performance and make adjustments to reflect their views on sectors or to understand what stocks are driving the performance of an individual sector. Uh, so it's much the same in the case of cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are more cryptocurrencies than stocks in, in the US right now, uh, but investors don't have a uh, comprehensive framework for understanding uh, the drivers of the returns within that cryptocurrency market without this type of categorization framework that we've developed. Uh, so we've tried to introduce eight different categories that can be used by traditional investors or crypto investors, much the same way that folks use the GICs level one sectors from S&P. Uh, and uh, those sectors are now trackable on Bloomberg. And we think they give a lot of information to investors to understand the performance drivers uh, within this fast crypto ecosystem. Well, these are distinct non-overlapping categories that form the building blocks for a new crypto classification scheme at Vanek. Can you tell us more about how these benefit investors? These eight Cryptocurrency categories that we've developed at Vanek are distinct, non-overlapping sectors that will give investors a better window into what's working and what's not in the broader cryptocurrency market. So we think that investors are going to use these categories to express their views uh, on a specific sector. Uh, within cryptocurrencies, and also to better understand how their diversified portfolio is acting by understanding the differences uh, between how these end markets are acting. Are there competing views on the categorization of crypto? And do you see, Matthew, these uh, categories uh, continuing to evolve? One of the challenges that we faced when deciding on the methodology for this type of taxonomy was whether to make the categories mutually exclusive. That is, many of our competitors have introduced more of a basket type approach. So collections of cryptocurrencies uh, that form an investable basket, but oftentimes one cryptocurrency will fit into more than one basket. And that makes it a little more challenging uh, to understand the broader performance dynamics uh, within the space. You might not uh, get a uh, full view of what's happening in a category if the coins that comprise it are also part of another category. Um, so I'd say that what, that was one of the big decisions that we had to make, which was uh, making these categories mutually exclusive. Another challenge has to do with just how fast moving and flexible this space is. Uh, many of these coins are open source uh, software projects uh, whose final destination is still unknown. And it's possible that the category that they're in now may not be the one that they're in tomorrow. Uh, so this exercise uh, is a recurring one, requires a lot of maintenance, uh, continual upkeep, and we, we should expect uh, the categories to change over time and the constituents also to change. Uh, and investors can uh, understand those changes by uh, going to the website, the Envis website or the Vanek website, where uh, the index categories are uh, released monthly. 
would you say in effect that these indices with common characteristics and value in measuring their performance um, as a group and, and are all indices uh, investable? On top of this crypto classification system that we've unveiled, we've released eight separate indices. So we've chosen the four most investable categories. And then for those categories, we've launched two indices for each of them. So a broad index that captures all the coins in that category, in that category, over $250 million market cap. And then a leaders index, which is the same category coins, but a larger market cap requirement, 1 billion and up. And then we've introduced an investability component. So a coin cannot make it into the leaders category unless it is traded on one of the top tier cryptocurrency exchanges and custodied by one of the top cryptocurrency custodians. And so in that way, the leaders indices represent a true investable benchmark that investors can use to measure their own performance and also also to the measure the performance of the categories versus each other. And that's a very helpful tool for investors in this space who have not had such a taxonomy uh, in the past. These categories comprise coins that have common characteristics and share common values. Uh, so we see value in measuring them as a group uh, and then measuring the groups versus each other to give investors an idea of how these baskets of coins with common characteristics are performing in the marketplace. So do you see any potential for new categories and classifications as the uh, crypto universe expands? We started with these eight categories that represent something akin to a GIX level one. So a, a broadest cut uh, of, of the ecosystem. We're in the process of working on and will soon release a level two categorization. So each of the eight categories has between three to five subcategories, uh, a further refinement of that system of common use, uh, common values, uh, creating um, groups of coins that investors can measure uh, against each other. Well, let's break down some of these categories for investors. The Streets Crypto Editor calls DeFi the next big thing in a real game changer. Do you agree with that and, and how so? Decentralized finance protocols, DeFi, these are essentially software programs that run on top of another cryptocurrency, and they use a combination of that protocol's asset as a means to automate a financial service. So DeFi protocols connect lenders and borrowers, buyers and sellers, without requiring a centralized institution. Um, DeFi protocols comprise an overlapping ecosystem of decentralized applications and smart contracts. Most operate on Ethereum, which is the largest open source blockchain smart contract platform, but many other blockchains now support decentralized finance applications. Matthew, which tokens top the uh, MVIS uh, DeFi leaders index and which such complicated earnings models? How are the leaders determined? The MVIS decentralized finance index comprises coins such as Uniswap, Aave, and Maker. Uh, these are the largest decentralized exchanges, uh, and they earn, they create value by hosting a marketplace uh, where buyers and sellers can meet to exchange cryptocurrencies and by taking a small commission of every trade. Uh, the, the complicating factor is that those commissions are denominated in the native token. So you pay Uniswap uh, in Uniswap coins, uh, and that represents a stream of earnings that can be valued by market participants using a discounted cash flow analysis or price to sales. Let's talk about DeFi protocols, um, which can be divided into several subcategories. What are they? And can you give us some examples of, of this? DeFi protocols include subcategories such as decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, lending and borrowing platforms like Compound and Aave, derivatives exchanges like Synthetix, asset managers like Mirror or Numeraire, insurance protocols like Nexus, and then protocols that aggregate all of those services together like Yearn Finance. Uh, it's really a, a fast-moving sector uh, with uh, a lot of changes uh, and uh, we hope that this classification and subcategory model will give investors a better idea of uh, what types of coins are working and what types of coins are underperforming. And that'll help capital get allocated more efficiently in the marketplace. What are some of the unresolved challenges that are uh, facing 
DeFi. Some say this is a chance to rebuild finance from the ground up. And, and would you agree with that? DeFi platforms enable buyers and sellers to find each other online without a centralized exchange or intermediary taking a large commission. Uh, and because it's a cheaper and faster uh, and less censored way to transact, uh, decentralized finance has been taking a lot of market share from both centralized crypto exchanges and the broader financial system uh, at large. Now, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties about the space still, uh, regulatory uncertainty, technological uncertainty, but the underlying innovation, faster, cheaper, more frictionless value transfer across the world, 365, 24-7, that's an innovation, a technological innovation that we don't think is going to slow down anytime soon. Huge advantage to the currency. Many uh, digital currency investors, Matthew, are familiar with exchanges. We use them, of course, for our digital currency transactions. Can you walk us through uh, this category um, for, the, uh, for the viewers? The exchange category includes the tokens of centralized cryptocurrency exchanges, such as FTX and Binance, who in many cases have chosen to list their entities as cryptocurrencies that trade on, exchange, on a cryptocurrency exchange rather than going public in an IPO on a traditional securities exchange. Many times the underlying model is similar. Uh, the exchange will collect profits that it derives from charging its users commissions, uh, and those profits will be denominated in the native token. In the case of FTX, that's the FTT token. Uh, so the exchange category includes those centralized cryptocurrency exchanges uh, like Coinbase, uh, who instead of listing in an IPO uh, or raising capital in the traditional private markets, instead uh, fund their equity uh, via these crypto tokens, uh, which trade uh, on crypto exchanges. Hackers, uh, Matthew, just, just hit the crypto exchange, crypto.com, siphoning some $35 million. What would you say are the biggest vulnerabilities and should investors brace for more theft of this size or not greater? As activity grows in cryptocurrency and, and indeed in, ev in any industry, there's always uh, opportunities and risks for technological mistakes and hacking. We've seen that in many in industries. In fact, the proportion of uh, cryptocurrency uh, illicit activity fell in 2021 versus 2020. Uh, so we're optimistic that increased analytics and tools in the industry are helping regulators and exchanges better monitor the flow of funds in the industry and more quickly apprehend the wrongdoers. Uh, so many of the largest hacks that we saw last year, the funds were actually returned voluntarily after the perpetrators were doxxed online, uh, thanks to the transparency that the blockchain provides. So it's true that in crypto, there are bad actors as there are in every industry, uh, but we're pretty optimistic that because of these uh, analytics and tools that are available to anyone who's observing the blockchain, anyone's crypto wallet can be tracked and monitored, uh, that the opportunities for wrongdoing uh, are actually falling over time, not rising. That's good news uh, for future investors. Let's talk about store va uh, value, Matthew. What is that and what falls under it, store of value? The store of value category includes Bitcoin and Bitcoin derivatives. Uh, so we believe that Bitcoin's proof of work consensus model is unique among cryptocurrencies. It provides the most robust security uh, and it guarantees that every Bitcoin that's created contains the same amount of thermodynamic energy. Uh, and that is a point of attraction for investors uh, who compare Bitcoin to a hard asset such as gold, which also requires uh, a lot of uh, physical investment in order to mine. Uh, so Bitcoin's high energy use uh, is more of a feature than a bug, but it does uh, merit its own category uh, as a store of value, thanks to the simplicity of its code, uh, its energy intensity, and importantly, its fixed supply, making Bitcoin really the only fungible asset in the world that doesn't respond to higher demand with higher supply. That cannot happen with Bitcoin. Very unique uh, qualities there. So investors often equate, uh, Matthew, Bitcoin to the whole crypto sphere, but there's so much more. How uh, should investors think about Bitcoin as it compares to um, other altcoins? 
The cryptocurrency industry is now $1.6 trillion, roughly. Of that, Bitcoin is about $700 billion. Um, so we think investors are starting to differentiate between the various categories in crypto. Uh, Bitcoin stands alone uh, as a store of value thanks to its unique proof of work consensus. Uh, we believe that it deserves a weighting in a portfolio that is commensurate with one's views on store of value. So maybe for gold and Bitcoin, that may be zero to 5% of an investor's portfolio. A large proportion of the ex-Bitcoin cryptocurrency universe is more closely related to the growth equity component of your investment portfolio. These are bets on software protocols that are gaining market share thanks to their innovative ability to send value across the world uh, in a more frictionless nature. Uh, so perhaps that allocation and in investors' portfolio, uh, the ex-Bitcoin uh, smart contract allocation, might also be a zero to five percent allocation, and perhaps it might be compared to uh, one's investment in Fang stocks, which represent twenty percent of the S and P five hundred, but whose profits may be at risk if indeed uh, cryptocurrencies form a competitive threat, uh, thanks to the lower cost and lower take rates that they charge. Uh, so that that's how that's how we think about it over here. Well, the street's uh, crypto editor says governance tokens are as important as DeFi as it tackles one of the core issues with crypto. For those new to this concept, can you explain governance tokens? Governance tokens are an important part of cryptocurrencies. So governance tokens represent the right to own the decision making of an entity. So if you owned 10% of the Uniswap DAO, the Uniswap Decentralized Autonomous Organization, then you would have a 10% vote in the corporate actions of that entity. So a decentralized autonomous organization is essentially a corporation that lives online where all stakeholders have the right to vote on corporate actions. And in many times, the entity cannot spend even a dollar without the approval of the DAO members. So this Governance uh, right can be very valuable if the underlying entity owns a valuable asset, such as a decentralized exchange, which might be earning you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in the case of Uniswap and trading profits. The Uniswap DAO's treasury is now $2 billion. And to spend even a dollar of it, the community has to vote. The community gets to vote. Uh, and that's why the, the token value of many of these governance tokens have uh, ballooned well beyond the size of the actual treasury. Uh, it's because these entities are earning profits uh, and the community gets to decide what the destination of those profits, the use of those profits. So it's a, it's a new wrinkle on the corporation, which restores autonomy to the everyday player uh, and really flips the script on capital formation. So we think we're going to see a lot of very interesting DAOs in 2022 uh, that raise a significant amount of capital. One of the most interesting was in late last year, the Constitution DAO that raised $43 million, tried to bid on a hard copy of the U.S. Constitution. They were outbid by Ken Griffith, uh, but we, we have a hunch that uh, the next DAO may not be so unlucky. No, it was a, it was a heck of a try, um, that's for sure. Um, let's talk about the uh, regulatory environment here for a moment. Is the regulatory environment around these uh, still uncertain? And what are you seeing? The U.S. regulatory environment is particularly uncertain. Uh, it's quite unique to have a new technology uh, that the U.S. is not leading on. Uh, and that is, uh, in large part, due to uh, the current administration's view on cryptocurrencies. Um, the current SEC is, uh, we think, holding the Bitcoin ETF hostage, trying to get Congress to act. Uh, you know, Every day that we move closer to a midterm, there is less chance of Congress acting. That's just the, the history of legislation. Uh, so we think this year uh, there's likely to be very little that happens uh, in terms of meaningful regulation. Uh, and in the absence of meaningful regulation, the innovation will keep moving forward. Um, so it's a, it should be a, a, a good year uh, for, for crypto because of that. 
you know, we've seen a flurry of partnerships between companies like MasterCard, Visa, American Express with cryptocurrency giants. What's driving all this activity? What's driving the activity among the credit card companies to release Bitcoin credit cards and other crypto credit cards is consumer demand. So consumers are sick and tired of unaccountable, unelected officials taking a large proportion of their savings, whether that's the banking sector or whether that's Web2. So they're asking for these products uh, and in return, the market is providing them. Uh, and we think that's a, a big reason why crypto volatility, specifically Bitcoin, is probably set to fall uh, over the coming years. The early adopters of this uh, technology were retail investors uh, who uh, were more volatile in their trading strategies. Uh, as the more sticky institutional buyers come in, uh, sovereign entities like El Salvador, which declared Bitcoin legal tender, corporations who now own more than 1% of Bitcoin outstanding, and the next leg will be these micropayments, credit card rewards, gaming, that will form uh, the base of the pyramid, a consistent source of demand, uh, tiny pieces of Bitcoin being bought by everyday people who are asking their financial institutions to provide products like these Bitcoin credit card rewards. So we're, we're hugely excited about that. We're trying to do some work on tracking the wallets uh, associated with these credit cards so that we can begin to size and scope uh, how big the demand will be. Uh, but it's a key linchpin in the thesis that Bitcoin volatility should fall over time. Yeah, good. Uh, it's a good move for uh, for consumers, I think. MasterCard recently uh, partnered with Coinbase for the crypto exchange's upcoming NFT marketplace. What could this mean for all the players as well as users? And could we see more partnerships like this uh, down the road? NFTs really just prove the ability to make digital items scarce. The original uh, the, the first killer app to demonstrate that utility for the marketplace was art, profile pictures, um, you know, files of, of digital art. Uh, this year, we think that utility will broaden out to include sports ticketing and concert ticketing, uh, along with uh, gaming applications. So in the case of, of ticketing, what if the uh, courtside NBA ticket that you bought also came with a 10% chance of dinner uh, with uh, one of the players after the game. Uh, that's the type of additional goods and services that can be bundled into an NFT, connecting the digital world with the real world, on top of it, proving digital scarcity, uh, unlocking a series of benefits for ecosystem participants. It's the same type of model that these cities like Miami uh, are trying to exercise with their city coins. Uh, if you own enough of the coin, you might get access uh, early to uh, say a museum opening or uh, a park. Uh, and in that way, uh, these cryptocurrencies really reward early participants, large participants who have conviction and, and incentivizes them to um, do good and, and avoid and avoid wrong. Uh, and NFTs will enable that type of uh, permissioned uh, techno technology solution uh, and bring a lot of value to consumers uh, over the next year. Matthew, media and enter entertainment is a pretty exciting area. NFTs are offering the early steps of monetizing the, the metaverse, of course. Can you walk us through that? Category. Consumers already play in the metaverse uh, when they use platforms like Roblox or Fortnite. Uh, these are real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds, uh, which can be experienced persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users uh, with an individual sense of presence, uh, with continuity of identity and history, and even some payments ability. The difference between the closed metaverse, the Roblox and Fortnite ecosystems, and the open metaverse is that the, in the open metaverse, all of these platforms can talk to each other and they all can operate on a common unit of account, whether that's a stable coin like US dollar coin uh, or whether that's a more traditional cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. And in the open metaverse, all these platforms being interoperable with each other will make a much more vibrant marketplace where consumers are going to have a lot more choice. Uh, and, and as we've seen in technology generally, uh, open source systems tend to beat closed systems. Uh, and we think that same thing is going to happen with the metaverse. Uh, so think of it as Roblox uh, or Fortnite, uh, but on the blockchain and interoperable uh, 
uh, because of the global nature of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so each of these metaverse platforms may have its own token uh, and may use that token to incentivize certain behaviors, whether that's uh, building interesting architecture, uh, displaying NFTs, lingering for a certain amount of time, making certain goods and services available to customers. Uh, all of that will happen within uh, each ecosystem's token, but those tokens will be interchangeable via Bitcoin or Ethereum or US dollar coin or other stable coins. Uh, so it really makes for a very scalable ecosystem, which users will share the currencies in common. Uh, and, and we think that's a more attractive uh, business proposition than walled garden ecosystems, uh, which tend to charge higher take rates uh, and which are smaller. Matthew, millennial investors are receiving one of the largest wealth transfers in history, $24 trillion. Why is it so important to understand this group of investors along with the investing process? You know that scene in Back to the Future when he's playing Johnny Be Good in front of all the high schoolers and they're all staring at him glassy eyed and he says, I guess you guys aren't ready for that, but your kids are going to love it. Uh, that's what's going on with cryptocurrencies. I can see it in my own family. The kids just understand this intuitively because they're digital natives and the old fogies don't get it. And every day more old fogies are dying and more kids are turning 18 and getting access to their own money. So the math is inevitable here, just like the math was inevitable when it came to gaming, World of Warcraft, Fortnite. Uh, the same thing will happen with digital currencies, and that's why it's, we, we think it's important to get an early start uh, to dollar cost average in, because many of these assets are expensive, uh, and to keep conviction that over the long run, because of this enormous wealth transfer uh, that's about to happen, trillions of dollars headed from baby boomers to the younger generation who are increasingly digital native, uh, they will adopt cryptocurrencies. There will not be young people who have zero weighting, uh, and that will be a, a big change in how assets are allocated uh, over time. Huge change from one generation to the next. It uh, happens through history, right? What are the key takeaways um, that investors should walk away with after this talk? The key takeaways here are that up till now, investors have not had a transparent, comprehensive taxonomy that they can use to measure uh, these uh, mutually exclusive cryptocurrency categories against each other. Uh, and when we think that the eight indices that, that we've released, these category indices, are going to do a great job of educating investors as to what are the common characteristics of these coins, how are they performing, as well as providing investable benchmarks that professional investors can use to measure themselves uh, against the market. So we plan to use them for both purposes here. That's fantastic. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, Matthew Siegel. You've been watching the Streets special presentation, Beyond Bitcoin and Metaverse, Crypto Categories Investors Should Know. I'm Bob Lang, and for more information, head over to thestreet.com or our partners at vanek.com. <music>